the narcissist is a ghoulish and sinister hybrid, an adult grafted onto a child. The narcissist is often described as a man-child, but he is actually neither. And the reason he appears so outlandish, so eerie, so creepy and weird, the reason he provokes the famous uncanny valley reaction, as if he were some kind of almost human, an android, a robot, the reason he provokes these emotions in his human surroundings is because he juxtaposes wrongly. He becomes an adult where he should have been childlike, and he becomes a child in adult situations. And this misappropriation and misallocation of roles render him monstrous or freakish, and very frequently both. Gradually, the narcissist is shunned by one and, and everyone, <laughs> by one and sundry. He is left alone, he is avoided, he is ignored, he is mocked and ridiculed and derided, he is exposed, he is confined. And so in this situation, the narcissist sources of narcissistic supply are depleted to the point that they cannot be recovered or reconstructed. And it is then that he resorts, however reluctantly, to self-supply. The more of a man-child the narcissist is, the more likely he is to end his life totally self-reliant, self-contained, self-subsisting, and self-supplying, a solipsistic atom drifting in the world with zero interactions. The narcissist's mental age is anywhere between two years and at the maximum nine years. Nine years is a high-functioning narcissist. The vast majority of people with narcissistic personality disorder get stuck at age two, when separation, individuation from mother fails. Imagine, that's an infant, not even a toddler. And that's the mental age, the emotional age of the narcissist. Cognitively, the narcissist is capable of the most amazing deeds and feats. But then, when he has to process the consequences of his actions, reactions by people, input, feedback, attempts to interface with him or to relate to him, he lacks the most basic apparatus, the most basic instruments, and he doesn't know what to do. And then he chooses to become an overbearing, coercive, sadistic, threatening, controlling adult, a parody of a man, an imitation of some kind, a simulation gun or eye, artificial intelligence which consists only of a hallucination. Or he regresses, he regresses at the speed of light, it's disorienting, and infantilizes, becomes a baby, in order to avoid responsibility and to broadcast, to signal to the environment, I'm a child, don't hurt me. In both situations, self-supply is critical. And today, I'm going to touch upon the eight or seven or eight techniques that narcissists use to self-supply. All narcissists go through schizoid phases. All of them withdraw from a world that had become injurious or mortifying. All of them process, lick their wounds, process, um, process trauma. All of them get re-traumatized. Narcissism is a post-traumatic condition, a form of CPTSD. So all of them get re-traumatized pretty easily. They're triggered. And so 
they go through schizoid phases. Self-supply is a critical component in the armory of the narcissist. It's, all, it's, it's a prime tool for self-regulation. Well, in the narcissist case, regulation is usually external. The narcissist does not have a self. He is selfless, so he doesn't have a sense of self. But he has a sense of self-worth. And his self-worth keeps fluctuating and to stabilize it and regulate it and monotonize it, if you wish, he resorts to outsiders, to sources of narcissistic supply. So he's very much, narcissist is very much like a borderline or to some extent like a codependent. There is external regulation going on. When this fails for objective reasons and sometimes for subjective reasons, the narcissist undergoes a mental health crisis or develops a kind of micropsychosis. So, so th these are subjective, it's a subjective background for avoiding people. Whenever the narcissist is incapable of extracting narcissistic supply from people, at that point, he becomes his own audience, his biggest fan, a member of his own cult, his god, and the only worshipper becomes a one-man society, a one-person culture, and the totality and entirety of history compressed into a single body. And that's the narcissist. Today's topic, how the narcissist, man-child, sells supplies. And apropos man-child, my name is Sam Vaknin. I am the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. I'm a former visiting professor of psychology in Southern Federal University, Rostov and Don, the thriving uh, Russian Federation. And I have been a member of the faculty of CIAPS for many, many years now, more than a decade. CIAPS is the Commonwealth for International Advanced Professional Studies, an outreach program. It has campuses or offices in Toronto, Canada, Cambridge, United Kingdom, and <laughs> another thriving location, Lagos. Nigeria. That was a mouthful, wasn't it? Okay, yeladim ve yeladot. Look it up. Let's delve right in. Self-supply is the ability to generate narcissistic supply, attention, adulation, admiration, affirmation, applause, self-congratulation, etc., or congratulation. So the ability to generate supply from the inside while convincing yourself that the supply is actually coming from the outside. So clinically speaking, self-supply is a delusional disorder. That's a clinical term. It's a delusion. And it involves a suspension or impairment of reality testing and a host of defense mechanisms. And I refer you to my video on defense mechanisms that I've made about a few days ago. And so they're all in action in the case of self-supply. But there are ways to engender, harvest and consume self-supply. There are techniques developed early on in life by the narcissist. And I'm going to discuss these techniques today. Technique number one, reframing reality, rewriting the narrative, reinventing the story in a way that buttresses, upholds, affirms and confirms the narcissist's inflated, fantastic, grandiose view of himself. Reframing reality involves filtering out, countervailing, negating and challenging information and data on the one hand and taking in elements of reality which can be profitably recombined into a plausible sounding story or narrative that convinces the narcissist himself 
that his false self is not false. So it's the narcissist treats reality as a kind of raw material. And then he processes this raw material to produce narcissistic supply in-house. It's like a moonshine, a moonshine factory making in-house, in, uh, making whiskey at home during the prohibition period. So he generates narcissistic supply inside, but he does use elements from reality. And the reason he needs to use realistic elements is because the narcissist is not actually clinically delusional. He is, he is partly delusional, but he is still very much in touch with reality through representations of reality in his mind, through internal objects. So he internalizes reality. And then, of course, he photoshops it, idealizes it, devalues it, processes it, reframes it, falsifies it, and everything else. So while the psychotic's raw material is his internal world, the narcissist's raw material is the external world, and he converts it into a 100% internal representation, internal tableau. So the narcissist reframes real reality in a way that helps him to admire himself to pay attention to himself, to adulate his own accomplishments, to be awed, awestruck, and speechless, faced with his own grandeur, magnanimity, charity, intellect, etc., etc., wherever the locus of control may be. So this is a reframing of reality. Mechanism number one. Now we all, to be clear, we all reframe reality very frequently. But we usually do it in order to avoid hurt and pain, unpalatable outcomes, in order to protect ourselves from dissonance and the anxiety that ensues. And so these are practical, functional reasons to reframe reality. The narcissist reframes reality needlessly, absolutely needlessly just in order to support a narrative or a story that is counterfactual mostly, not fully, but mostly. So in this sense, the narcissist behavior is very similar to the generation of an ideology. Narcissists are ideological. They have an ideology and they are religious Narcissism is a form of private religion. A narcissist is God and the only worshipper and the body of the church. So this rigidity, because religions are rigid, ideologies are even more rigid. Ideologies are secular religions. So this rigidity is what forces the narcissist to constantly rewrite reality because reality is not rigid. Reality is surprising and flexible and unpredictable and indeterminate and uncertain. And that's not helpful. That's not helpful because the narcissist's only defense against disintegration, against decompensation, the only defense is the belief that some things are immutable, unchangeable, forever. No, not God, <laughs> the narcissist, or more precisely, his view of himself. That is for eternity. The second mechanism is to create an inflated counterfactual self-perception in a way that no longer requires external, output, external input. So to kind of augment, ossify, rigidify, and fossilize the narcissist perception of himself, which is, as I said, often counterfactual, always inflated and fantastic. So to cast this self-perception in stone and marble so that it becomes a work of art for the ages. So once this is done, there is no need for narcissistic supply 
from the outside. The only thing the narcissist needs to do is to regurgitate, recycle, rehash old supply. Become, narcissist becomes his own secondary source of supply, his own recording mechanism, recording and replay mechanism, a reenactment of his days of glory, his accomplishments, the uh, the reactions from the from the environment, etc., etc. So he sits there, convinced of his own uh, grandiose self-perception, convinced of his own divinity, convinced that he's a deity, and he recycles memories essentially, also reframed, also falsified, but what he perceives as memories. He recycles them to constantly buttress and support this self-perception. So if the narcissist, for example, has an image of himself as a good, helpful person, um, if he has an image of himself of, of, as someone who is always victimized, or if he has an image of himself as someone who is constantly at the center of conspiracies and malign attention by others because of envy or hatred or whatever. It, these are examples of self scripts, self narratives that no longer require input from the outside. The narcissist, uh, the narcissist would say, uh, and, and it flies in the face of evidence, the narcissist could commit any and every conceivable reprehensible moral act anything from stealing to 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 i mean you name it narcissists would do anything and then he would say i'm a good person i've done these things because i had no choice i had no choice because i'm traumatized or because i'm victimized or because i was forced to do it or because i was manipulated or because I was misled, or because I am a people pleaser and I just wanted to please others, or because I'm codependent and, and I'm mentally ill and I can't help it. And so this is an example of, of self-supply. Similarly, when the narcissist constantly casts himself as a victim, he can do no wrong. He's, he's never responsible for his choices and decisions and it's everything is coming from the outside. All his intimate partners are evil and corrupt and horrible and tormented the, the poor the poor thing and you know he couldn't help it it's just uh, that's an example of self-supply and of course paranoid ideation is a major instrument of self-supply this paranoia by definition requires secrecy requires isolation you isolate yourself because you are at risk you're under a threat, you're threatened. So you isolate yourself, but you can perceive the act of isol isolating yourself as an aggrandizing act. You're isolating yourself because you're a very important person. You are the butt of conspiracies at the center, at the center of conspiracies. You are, you are of interest, I don't know, to the CIA or to some group of people who are gang stalking you and, and so paranoia is the flip side of the narcissism coin it's a grandiose reaction a grandiose cognitive distortion and when you develop paranoid ideation it's a double yummy as far as self-supply because it legitimizes your isolation and it convinces you that you are a very very crucial person, a person of import. And so paranoid ideation is very common in self-supply. The next technique is to reassign weights to sources of supply. So you rank certain sources of supply as low and others as rich, poor and rich, negative and positive, fake and real. So you assign weights to sources of supply and it is your power as an arbiter, as a judge, as a referee 
to decide which source of supply would count and which one would be discounted or discarded. It is this power that constitutes self-supply. So the narcissist who self-supplies this way sits, sits at home alone and ticks off boxes. This source of supply is meaningless. This source of supply is important, but I got all the supply I needed. This, and so he kind of rearranges the narcissistic supply space, the pathological narcissistic space, in a way that all sources of supply become extensions of the narcissist under his judgment and control. He decides their destiny and fate and hierarchy and ranking and it gives him a feeling of um, being godlike. The next uh, technique in self-supply is to convert negative to positive supply. When the narcissist receives negative supply, for example, when he is criticized, when he is attacked, when he is ridiculed or mocked, when he is threatened, when he's, he can take this and convert it into positive supply. One way of doing it is via paranoid ideation. They are threatening me because I mean a lot to them. They are stalking me because I, to this very day, I'm a very important person in their emotional lives. They can't give up on me. They're sad, they're heartbroken that I'm out of their lives. They are threatening me because they're desperate and there's nothing else they can do. Um, they're helpless. They're helpless because I'm omnipotent. They are ridiculing me and mocking me because they're stupid. They're getting it wrong. They can't understand certain things. And so ultimately they are the, they are the derisory figures. They are, they are worthy of derision and, and so on and so forth. So taking negative supply and converting it into positive supply by reframing the situation, making many assumptions and creating many hypotheticals, and then constructing a coherent, cohesive, self-consistent narrative around this, around these assumptions and, and figments. And so the negative supply suddenly becomes proof of importance, proof of meaningfulness proof of significance. So narcissists very often would brag about having enemies. They would share the threats they're getting. They would, they would uh, be gratified by, by how important they are, how important they still are to the people who are attacking them, threatening them, berating them, uh, mocking them, etc., etc., because this is exactly like paranoid ideation. The narcissist is still the center of attention. This is one way of self-supply. The next technique of self-supply is future or past orientation. The narcissist can tell himself, I will be recognized only in the future. I am so ahead of my time. I am such an incredible genius that only future generations will adulate me, admire me, and appreciate my contribution. And these future generations become real to the narcissist because the narcissist interacts only with internal representations. And so he basks in the glow of his future glory yet to be realized, actualized, and accomplished. Another way is to go back to the past, to develop a past orientation and to say, well, I have changed the world. I have been meaningful. I have done this and I have done that. And then to assume that you are still present in the minds of those, gener of those generations in the past, somehow. So it's to impute presence, influence to people in the past or to people in the future. 
That's one way of self-supply. The next, next way to self-supply is very similar to paranoid ideation, but not exactly. It's self-aggrandizing referential ideation, ideas of reference. It's to assume that any post made on Instagram is about you. Any video or video snippet has to do with you. They are hidden messages. They are occult signals. There's an attempt to communicate or beg you to communicate. There's, so the belief that other people's speech acts, behaviors, choices, and decisions revolve exclusively around you is known as referential ideation and is a major form of self-supply. The narcissist develops a theories, multiple theories, as to why people behave the way they do, especially if they do it in public. Why they behave the way they do? Because of him. It all has to do with him. They are processing grief. They are threatening him. They are making a promise. They are attempting to communicate. You name it. It's going to create a theory of why they behave the way they do, which has to do with him. Of course, in the vast majority of cases, these theories are wrong. <laughs> Preferential ideation is often wrong. And finally, another method of self-supply described by scholars who worked with mortification, with narcissistic mortification. It's the delusional revenge fantasy. Delusional revenge fantasies, especially after mortification, are major ways to self-supply. The narcissist goes into extreme, intricate, fine detail in planning revenge upon his enemies, real and perceived. He, he, he lives the revenge. This is known as imagery. It's like an imagery exercise. He, he enters his revenge becomes like a, a theme park and he enters the theme park and he he cultivates and nurtures and waters and thinks about and contemplates and considers and analyzes and synthesizes everything. It becomes a full-time job, it becomes a pastime, a hobby. And the revenge fantasy fulfills him with a sense of omnipotence and even omniscience because he knows what he's planning, they don't. He knows what's coming, they don't. And this asymmetry of information gratifies him no end and caters to his sadistic side as well. This is a form of self-supply. Now, there are many other forms of self-supply, but these are the most common strategies. Self-supply is a crucial maintenance phase in the narcissist, in the narcissist cycle of existence. Narcissists often run out of narcissistic supply and they have to self-supply or perish. And so they self-supply. Additionally, self-supply is a mechanism of self-regulation that appears to be external regulation. So it's ego congruent. It doesn't disrupt the narcissist uh, balance, equilibrium. It, it, uh, the narcissist experiences self-supply as a natural continuation of external supply because he makes no distinction between external um, objects and internal objects. Everything is happening in his, in his mind, in his head. So self-supply is perceived as external, especially if the self-supply is linked intimately to specific internal objects, which represent people out there, real external objects. Internal objects in his mind are infused with the energy of the self-supply. They are cathected with self-supply. And so they attain, these internal objects attain an existence of their own and are misperceived as external. The synopsis classic confusion between internal and external objects. In many ways, what I'm describing is a bit psychotic because it involves elements of hyper-reflexivity. And this is what Kernberg 
This is Kelvin's observation. That's why he called borderline borderline on the border between neurotic and psychotic. Self-supply is the purest form of supply and the crystallization of the narcissistic disorder of the self. It is through self-supply, through the prism of self-supply, that we can study pathological narcissism better than any other way. Isolate the narcissist on an island and his narcissism would transition smoothly and seamlessly from external supply to self-supply. The narcissism will continue unhindered. The narcissistic personality structure and organization will not be disrupted or interrupted. But the supply would become internal and to a very large extent delusional. The narcissist man-child is on the border between man and child, undecided, in limbo, borrows elements from both. And because it's a very young child, self-supply is very, very reminiscent of certain dynamics in childhood, such as primary narcissism. And yet it involves adult, adult elements, such as revenge fantasies. And so again, we see the chimeric nature of the narcissist, the hybrid nature of the narcissist. It is a man or a woman, of course, not fully formed, half-baked, disrupted in a process, a human being interrupted. Similarly, magical thinking, which is typical of childhood, is an integral part of self-supply. The narcissist confuses the reality of his internal world with the reality of the external world. Consequently, events and dynamics that are happening inside his mind are misperceived to have occurred or to be occurring in the outside, externally, in the real world. Gradually, the narcissist comes to develop superstitions and believes that he is capable of affecting the outside world by merely altering his internal landscape, by, by merely thinking about something or wishing something to happen or imagining something or believing in something, he induces in his mind, he induces change in his environment, both human and inanimate. This is very typical thinking in childhood. Children have this, more or less until age 36 months, but it survives into adulthood in pathological narcissism and is at the core of self-supply. The narcissist projects his supply onto an unsuspecting environment, but because to his mind there's no distinction between in and out, internal and external, this act of projecting the supply outward is misperceived as receiving supply from the outside. Actually, the supply is 100% internal, but perceived or misperceived as 100% external. Magical thinking is another example of the man-child hybrid in narcissism. And there's also the issue of the action of primitive defense mechanisms, such as projection, but also splitting, projective identification, and so on. These infantile regressive defense mechanisms no longer operate in adulthood in the vast majority of healthy and normal people. But with a narcissist, they still very much dominate. Narcissism, pathological narcissism, is a failure at, develop, at developing adult defense mechanisms. And so the childhood ones, the childlike ones, or the infantile defense mechanisms survive. Self-supply relies on these mechanisms. For example, the narcissist splits everyone into all good people and all bad people. 
and the old bad people are after him. They're out to get him. And this, this fosters paranoid ideation. But of course, paranoia is a form of grandiosity. Similarly, the narcissist divides the entire world into good and evil, black and white, hot and cold, loving and hating, and so on and so forth. This splitting mechanism creates the equivalent of a morality play. The narcissist is on the side of good versus evil, is on the side of good people versus evil people, is being persecuted and prosecuted and threatened by really, really bad characters. <laughs> now, this is a form of rewriting the world as a theater play, rendering the world a theater play. The cinematic aspects of the narcissist's mind and life are undeniable in self-supply. That's why I keep saying that self-supply is the purest form of pathological narcissism. Some reminders. Locus of grandiosity. The narcissist is grandiose. He distorts reality, reframes it, so as to support an inflated and fantastic self-image. Grandiosity, therefore, is a cognitive distortion. But there is a mis misperception of grandiosity, as usual, among self-styled experts online. Grandiosity is not about being the best, the, fa the fastest, the greatest, the most amazing. <laughs> grandiosity is about being special, unique, one of a kind, sui generis, unprecedented. So, listen well. Even negative input, even scathing feedback, even the most extreme criticism, humiliation, put downs, uh, you name it, even these can constitute narcissistic supply. Sometimes you attack the narcissist, you go at the narcissist, you try your best to humiliate the narcissist, to expose the narcissist, to deride the narcissist, to laugh at the narcissist, to mock, to ridicule, and so on and so forth, only to discover that all this time you have been providing the narcissist with narcissistic supply a plenty. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, if the attack or the criticism or the, the humiliation, or if they are sufficiently extreme, they constitute narcissistic supply. So, if you tell the narcissist, you are the biggest abuser ever. You are the most accomplished con artist. You are the most egregious failure. You are the most unprecedented waste. <laughs> These are forms of narcissistic supply. They will not lead to narcissistic injury and they will not result in mortification because they aggrandize the narcissist. They render the narcissist special, unique, fascinating, amazing, the center of attention. It's the wrong way to go about it. Okay, so this is uh, the first point, the locus of grandiosity. A narcissist could be very proud of his failures, of the fact that he is a loser, of his abuse, of his misconduct simply because they are unprecedented, they are special and unique and amazing and egregious and extreme and radical. That renders him, renders him one of a kind, hence narcissistic supply. Uh, 